Good morning, church. It's been a while since I've been here, (laughs) as in up here, uh, behind this pew, uh, behind this beautiful place. My name's Rob Morang. Uh, My family and I love you very much. We love you because we love his church, and we love you because we love this church. But way more importantly than that is, whether you know it or not, you love us. This church loves us mightily and well, and we are so appreciative of the love that we've received, the service and leadership that we've, that's been bestowed on us and blessed from Jesus through you. It's miraculous. And we've been able to share a little bit of that love over these many years that we've been under your wings that are so lovely and so loving that we've been able to bless some other families and some other people that are struggling. And we just want to encourage you that uh, these walls are not walls. Your work within these walls is out there in the world, right? And I thank you for that. And if I was pastoring this church, I probably wouldn't dare brag on you from the pulpit like this, but I'm not your pastor. So I'm bragging on you, okay, because I love you and I love the work that's here, the light that shines right here at this corner. Thank you all. So I've prayed through this study of the book of Micah that I've been working on, and I'm praying that the Lord would give us a deeper hunger and a stronger urge and a necessary urge in this dark world to bring light and life to God's holy word as we read it, as we study it. So to help with that, I have an announcement. Some of you have, didn't, maybe don't know this. I'm a granddad. More specifically, thank you, thank you. More specifically, oh, and Brandy's a grandmom. I can't leave that out. More specifically, she's a Bammy. I'm a Bampy. I looked at the criteria that are right and true, and I'm not complaining, but for Sunday announcements, And that announcement didn't meet any of your criteria. So I said, well, I've got to get it in, right? Some people might not know. So I'll do it as a sermon illustration. I've had some time to spend time with a little baby lately. Did you know that when babies are first born, they're blind? Ah, They're blind. They're, They're colorblind. They can't see colors when they're first born. I thought that was interesting. And then I said, inside the United Baptist Church, there might be some brand new believers that are kind of colorblind, but also within these walls are people that aren't brand new in the faith, right? And those people that aren't new in the faith, as babies start to see color, they start to see shades. And as they develop those first months of life, they see shades, and then they see colors, and then as they grow into toddlers, they can see colors like you and I can see that. So as we study these words that are in black and white this morning, I want us to see color. I want us to see the colors that are in these words in a lot of different ways, literally and figuratively. It's very important that every time we open our Bible in January, we start reading plans, right? that we see color. Let's start to see the characters. Let's start to talk with the characters and think what they're thinking. And let's start walking with these characters in our Bibles as we read. Let's pray for the Lord's help. Lord, each week we pray for your spirit to come upon us and enable us to worship you and to learn about you in order that we may walk in the name of you, our God. We ask that you now, by your spirit, supernaturally help us to understand the evil in the day of Micah. Help us to see what you teach when you say the heads of Jacob and the rulers of Israel were tearing the skin from off of your people. Lord, we want to know good, that we may love it more. Lord, help us to hate evil as you hate evil. Father, bring this book to life for us today. God, we ask that we have understanding of things from long ago and that we may understand today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Have I studied the book of Micah? 
I kind of feel like I'm on a teeter-totter ride, and I know you guys probably haven't been studying it as I have been, but it's any of the minor prophets, you kind of feel like that. You see all this evil, and then you see God's faithful promise. And that's what I felt like as I've studied. So let me just give you the theme of Micah quickly. It is judgment to those that are dead set against defying the Lord, and it is the Lord consistently and faithfully keeping his covenant promises to his people. In the beginning of Micah, there's lots of contrast between the Lord and these evil rulers that Pastor Tim read about for us in that scripture. The evil described is executed by these rulers of Judah and Israel, and they've meted out justice upon injustice in order to benefit themselves. Yet the Lord says, hope is not lost. And I've asked the Lord for understanding, and I ask you now, United Baptist Church, to dig in with me here. Engage with this text, believer. You are able to see it. You are able to see. Open your eyes. You're able to hear. Open your ears. Imagine. Visualize. The Lord gave us this gray matter, even for Tim and I, between our ears. (laughs) Use it now. Use it every time you open up the Old Testament. You will find so much fruit, so much blessing. Put yourself in the shoes of the characters. Picture yourself as a lame cast off, even when you're surrounded by your family and being loved. Okay, so here we go. So we back up. We didn't do just three, we did uh, just four. We did, Tim read from the end of three all the way through to the end, uh, to beginning of uh, the end of chapter three and the, to the end of chapter four. And as we read about that in chapter 3, can you feel what it would be like to have the religious rule and the political rule all be one? Our world's pretty far from that right now. Political rule, we have a religious rule, right? But we don't have it all one in one thing, and they did back then. And then you look at verse 10 of chapter 3. Who builds Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The powerful in that time are heaping dead upon dead upon dead, and they're trotting along on top of those dead to build their own things, to build their own kingdoms. I don't want to be too graphic, but look at the text and let it stir your heart. It does good for us to understand what evil the Lord, the Lord ordained for this to be here. These words. It may be good for us to realize that the strong are preying on the weak. These leaders are spilling blood in order to magnify their evil intents in their selves. And you talk about using the Lord's name in vain. Here we see it in verse 11. It's not the Lord in the midst of us. No disaster shall come upon us. What can be more evil than that? We know how the Lord feels about the afflicted. We know how he feels about those that are downtrodden. And here they're claiming to be his servants, and they are anything but. They call their power his power. And they build a mountain of man instead of making much of him. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. And now we start chapter 4 with that in mind, right? And then we hear this promise from the Lord. So set that stage. That's what's going on in this. This is real people doing real things. This is real history. There is no more clear history than what we read in our Bibles, right? So this happened. Now we're going to read this. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and the people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. 
and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Oh, taste this, church. Taste this good news. Taste it now as we read and study and share. Just imagine those people. They must have been just longing for a decent leader, a leader that was just going to be neutral, maybe not even do them harm. And they have people picking at their flesh that are supposed to be protecting them and caring for them and loving them. As the Lord had ordained in his Bible, as we see in the, all through the New Testament, And then we see quickly this promise from the Lord for the latter days. When are the latter days? Some of you are probably asking that. Most of the commentators say this latter days that that Micah is referring to and the Lord is referring to here is the thousand thousand year reign in which Satan will be thrown into a pit temporarily and that there will be peace and that the Messiah will reign. What all the commentators pretty much agree on is this is the Messiah in his rule and reign. And some people would argue that it's maybe not that specifically that thousand-year rule. But that thousand-year rule is described in chapter 20 of Revelation at the back of your Bibles. And you can find it there. And that makes the most sense to me. But what they all agree on, that chapter 4 of the book of Micah is a chapter about the Messiah, about Jesus the Christ. And we see a lot of contrast in our text this morning. We read of the powerful. And we read of the rule of the evil. And how this good, gracious, kind ruler is to come. So what do we learn about the Messiah from our passage this morning? Well, to start with, he's a faithful preacher, right? They will be coming to the highest of the mountains. Nations will flow uphill with this Messiah. And why are the people coming to this Messiah? To learn his ways. The teacher will teach those that are to come to him. And when they come, he will teach. He will declare his law to his people, his word. When I read this, I thought of Jesus on a Sermon on the Mount, right? He's up above people and he's talking to his disciples. And what did he preach, folks? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In our verses today, we see a mountain, and we see the Messiah teaching his ways, just like he did in the New Testament when he was here. And from Mount Zion shall go forth the law. The message of the Old Testament is the message of the New Testament. And here we see it. One Messiah and one Lord. Imagine the poor and needy hearing these words back in Micah's day, and when Micah was ministering. There will be peace. Israel had fought and fought and fought. The Old Testament is full of records of wars and battles and bloodshed. And even to this day, is Israel at peace really? Surrounded by people that want to consume that nation. Is the church at peace, really? It might feel like at Nelsworth, Maine. But if you do a little study, there's persecuted church all over this planet, right? And sometimes it can feel like it is in Nelsworth, Maine. Some of you have been persecuted. So we've got to use our imaginations to think of this and imagine what it was like back then and for those brothers and sisters that are struggling now. And maybe look in the mirror and see that struggle that you're facing. This is good news of peace, right? And there will be time where they won't be afflicted by these evil rulers. And some of us may struggle with our imaginations, but we have some veterans in the house, right, that know what war is like. That I can't sit and imagine real well. But I just think of them and maybe asking them a story. Asking them, hey, when we can have perfect peace, what will be in your mind's eye? 
How will that contrast to the battles of Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq? Think of the families in the Ukraine we played last week at our church, Eden. A kind saint brought up all the struggles that are going on in the Ukraine right now. And all those families that have been afflicted by much disaster and war. Those people that are subject to rule in Russia and, F and Ukraine that are right now literally are building their own mountains. Those rulers are building their own mountains by the blood of those that they're supposed to be protecting. Now, the Messiah won't be just a righteous ruler, but he'll also be a righteous judge. We haven't studied it yet, but in the first three chapters of Micah, we see this picture of judgment and a judge, and we see evil judging that's going on in this in uh, Judah and Israel, and then we see this vivid contrast of what the Lord promises. A perfect judge. A judge who gives and ministers real justice, true justice for all the nations. And the results, what we see in our text today, next. We see, he shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. What a sweet sound this must have been to those people. Imagine hearing that in some of these corrupt nations that are all over this planet. Imagine that in our nation when people are corrupted and underneath a judgment of unrighteousness, a judge that wants to consume them. And now we have a credible promise of peace after generations and generations of Israel going under evil judges and judges that were bolstering themselves, that would work for bribes. Just imagine us being able to send our children out in our farmland without protection. That's what's promised here that they will just simply sit underneath their tree that's theirs, that they've been blessed with by the Lord, and enjoy the fruit of that tree. No more, what time you're going to be home? Who's out there? What do I have to look for in some registry to see if my neighborhood's safe? They will all be safe, and all the saints will be there. These implements of war are needed no more. Swords and spears of war will be fashioned into farming tools. They're necessary in the here and now, these weapons of war. They will no longer be necessary. The armed will not harm the unarmed, because there will be no armed. <laughs> and now just imagine that family under Micah's day hearing that this good news is coming. Just a regular old family in Israel faced with war and war and war since they were born and their forefathers and forefathers and forefathers have all faced it the same. And now we read this, of peace. This family will not be attacked from its own nation, its own people, forefathers are supposed to be protecting them. The women will be safe, the children will be safe, the men will not be going to war. And a family will just be able to sit in their own farmland and enjoy blessing the Messiah will also be a forever king. In the lame, I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Jesus will reign over this nation that has been so afflicted. The lame and the cast-offs will become strong, and they will be assembled. They will be unit, a unit, a strong nation. <laughs> Jesus came as a king. Jesus is a king, always was a king, always will be a king. And he's a servant leader that will lead and love, and he's a servant leader that is truly 
not looking for those that would serve him. He serves us. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pain seized you like a woman in labor? Writhe and grow, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. Now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. This takes us back from the latter days, back to Micah's day, those two verses I just read. And it's a warning. The Lord blesses us with warnings in the New Testament, right? We see lots of warnings. Jesus taught a lot of warnings, right? And this is a warning here. We have a couple questions in verse 9, and then we get the answers. You're going to leave this city, and you're going to feel agony, he tells the people. Micah tells the people. And it's a pretty descriptive picture he portrays. If anybody's been part of a childbirth, especially the moms that have been part of a childbirth, is this pain? We can read over that. Even Pastor Tim can read that. And we don't see or feel it. Probably even moms maybe don't really realize until you slow down and think and empathize what this is like to be thrown out of their city and out of their nation and go to Babylon. Not a nice place, right? Biblically, a horrible place. This is an ugly picture with serious pain because they won't be led. People without a king, without a counselor, without a ruler. But the sovereign Lord who is over all and sees all and knows all knows that this is going to happen. So he warns his people and get them ready. Yeah, there's going to be peace in the latter days. We ain't there yet, folks, I think is a paraphrase. Get ready. And history tells us the Israelites did indeed get captive and taken in Babylon in 583 B.C., subsequent to the writing of Micah. So you imagine the people wondering, is it my generation or is it another generation? And their forefathers have been exiled, right? To Pharaoh in Egypt. In the picture of the slavery and the suffering and the great deliverance, they had all that in their minds and they're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm headed here. But then at the end of 10, the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. And this is that teeter-totter I was talking about. We see that he's faithful no matter what. I may be sovereign over you getting exiled to Babylon, but I am sovereign over your deliverance. I will redeem you. My glory will be done. My promises come true every single time. And the Lord sees fit to have Israel conquer their enemies. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hooves brawn, and shall beat into many peoples, pieces and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. The people will defeat these nations. Whatever their plot, whatever their plan, even if and they will be coming to Zion, they will return. The Lord will restore them. And this Zion, these people, the Lord's chosen, will pulverize the nations that seek to do them ill. And God will be magnified in the process. So here we finish in chapter 4, seeing that nations will plan and plot against God people. And we can turn on our news programs anytime we want and see the same thing. Israel is surrounded right now by nations that would like to destroy it, that would like to consume it. And some of us here have felt Micah 4 in our lives. And the Lord will even afflict some of us. Are we ready for that, Lord? Have you felt that before? Does that mean he is far from us? No, that means he's refining us. And he loves us. And he's preparing us. And he's warning us sometimes, like he does in this chapter. So what are we, do to, what are we to do today? About a month ago was Christmas time when we celebrated hope. We did at Eden Pretty sure you guys did here at United Baptist Church. I think I was even here for a couple of those messages. 
This book of Micah is a book of hope. We are to have faith in the Lord that his promises come true every time. And faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The latter days are coming, brothers and sisters. The days of evil are numbered. The days of sickness will cease. The days of death will be no more. Attacks, attacking, even having to defend ourselves. What peace we'll have. We will rest. Each of us, through Jesus' redemptive work, will sit in our own farms, under our own fig trees, under our own, in our own vineyards, and enjoy and reap what the Lord has sown for us. The blood that was shed on that cross was to build a mountain too. But unlike the evil leaguers that we read of in Israel and Judah and even today, shedding blood to build up their own mountains, Jesus shed his blood to build a kingdom. And he was already a king. His blood was shed that we may have life. That we may be his heirs. And we're part, it become part of an eternal kingdom where our struggles and our strife and our pain is very real. But we'll be no more. It is limited. Ultimately, as true as it will be then, it's true today, no less so. That pain is defeated, that evil is defeated, that sin is defeated through the blood shed on that cross, on that mountain, for you, for me. Be warned, though. The Bible promises all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We've got to remember the long game. We've got to remember that the latter days are coming. These bodies are frail. I'm up here preaching to you because these bodies are frail, right? They will fail. We have so much greater hope, but we forget it sometimes. I forget it sometimes. You forget it sometimes. That we have a hope of peace, of joy, every tear wiped away. No children suffering from abuse. Nobody sold in slavery. Us just serving the Lord and worshiping the Lord. Using the gifts that he bestowed upon us. And he will rule and he will reign. And every step that he's ordained will happen for our good and his glory. We only need to trust him and obey him and his word. And we will deliver be delivered from evil and celebrate with our king forevermore.